Uh, our next paper is Can Credit Rating Affect Credit Risk? Causal Evidence from an Online Lending Marketplace. <coughs> and Alexander Worth from the University of Michigan is going to present. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and share my research. Uh, as George said, my name is Alex Worth. I'm a finance PhD student at the University of Michigan, and this is joint work with my advisor, uh, Amitash. So getting right into it, today I am going to try to answer the question, is how does credit rating impact credit risk for households? Specifically, imagine two households who are identical in their payment history, their perceived credit risk, and their likelihood of paying back a loan, but shock one of them what's appearing on their credit reports and the credit score that's going out to you as lenders. Now, why do we care about this question? Well, first, there is a large theoretical literature in corporate finance, but also household finance, that ratings independent of quality can matter for real borrower outcomes. Specifically, there's coordination theory, where if a borrower is perceived to be of high quality, they can get credit from others, and that can affect the real outcomes. There's feedback effects. If you're a borrower and your credit score goes up, that could mean you pay a lower interest rate. If you are a, a corporate borrower and your credit rating goes up, this could also feed back into your interest rates, and you could have better outcomes because of this. And last, as people in this uh, room know quite well, that there are regulatory reasons that credit scores can matter for real outcomes. You might be restricted from making loans in certain categories based on someone's credit score. So that is a motivating factor for this question. But an another huge reason that I was interested in this is we know that among equivalently credit worthy borrowers, there is variation in their credit score. Now, how do we know this? Well, as one example, in 2012, the FTC did an audit study where they sent out detailed credit report data to 1,000 consumers. And they went, with, went through them on their, uh, these credit reports with them. And about 25% of them found uh, material errors. And among these 25%, half of them back computed that these errors could imply erroneous credit scores by as much as 20 to 30 points. So this is a, a pretty serious uh, implication for potential the pricing of their loans and whether they get a loan. Also, we have a very recent example of people being judged by erroneous credit scores. Equifax, who has been in the news a few times in the last few years, um, they admitted in 2022 that they sent out millions of erroneous credit scores to consumers that oftentimes resulted in higher interest rate for borrowers or being completely rejected. And among these millions who uh, received inaccurate credit scores, tens of thousands of them had numbers that were off by as much as 25 points. So really to sum it up, we know that there are people out there who for all intents and purposes are the same, they should be evaluated the same in their credit risk, but there is a different uh, report with the credit bureau for them and they have a different number. So there's uh, an obvious challenge to answering the question of how much credit reporting matters for their credit risk is in general, people who have higher credit scores are more credit worthy. It's an incredibly endogenous outcome. So how am I identifying exogenous variation in credit reporting, also known as how can I find two people who are effectively the same, but they have different credit scores? Well, to preview what I'm going to do to find this variation, we are going to utilize the CARES Act, which passed on March 25th, 2020, when the pandemic was starting to pick up. And it retroactively applied a law that said if you were a borrower and you entered a forbearance plan with your lender um, on January 31st or later, normally those forbearance plans are reported to credit bureaus. And this hurts your credit score, which I will show. But now it was illegal for that to be reported to credit bureaus. So we have some people who went on these forbearance plans, but before COVID started, after January 31st, who weren't reported late and their credit score is going to be artificially higher relative to borrowers entering forbearance before January 31st. So to give you a preview of the findings, I think the magnitude is probably um, the more important factor here than necessarily the direction. For borrowers who entered forbearance immediately after January 31st, so people who got an artificial boost to their credit score, they defaulted at a 
40% lower rate over 10 months on the loan data set I'll shortly talk about compared to borrowers who entered forbearance slightly before and got a negative hit to their credit score. So you can think of this as there's a negative credit reporting shock to these borrowers. It takes a couple months to flow through to their credit score and eventually they default at a higher rate. And I'll show you shortly, this is what we see. It takes a little while to flow through their credit score and their default differential over the first few months is not that different. But long term, uh, uh, the people who got a positive boost default at much lower rates. And the effects are concentrated in people who ex ante before uh, they entered forbearance were of higher quality, and I'll talk more about that in the interpretation at the end. And there is suggestive evidence that these borrowers who went on forbearance before January 31st and had lower credit scores lost access to external financing. So to give you some detail of the research setting and what I'm using to answer this question, we are using data from the online lender Lending Club. And Lending Club uh, allows households to apply for loans, and most of these households are using a Lending Club loan to consolidate debt, and they usually uh, receive loans that are three or five year fixed amortization schedules to pay off debt that they might have from a credit card, maybe an auto loan, um, and, and maybe a few other sources. Now, Lending Club, if you are a borrower and you start to have distress, might offer you a hardship plan. Now, what is a hardship plan? They might, for example, let you skip two months of payments to get back on your feet. And the benefit of this as a borrower is you don't enter default, and the lender hopes that you can recover and pay back the loan in full, but this has historically always shown up on your credit report, and your credit score will drop less than if you defaulted, but there still will be um, a downward trend by taking one of these plans if you were a borrower. Now, what are we going to use to identify variation in credit reporting for equivalently creditworthy borrowers? Well, this figure I have up here on the horizontal axis, we have dates. On the vertical axis here, we have the number of borrowers on hardship. Uh, in December of 19, January of 20, and February of 20, there's, there's only a few hundred borrowers. But the first vertical line here I have is, this is when the World Health Organization declared a pandemic in the middle of March. We all go home, learn what the Zoom is for the first time, maybe bake sourdough bread, whatever your thing was. Um, the CARES Act was passed at the end of March, and as I mentioned briefly in the introduction, the key part here, it was retroactive to January 31st. So I have, as you can see labeled there, treatment borrowers. These were borrowers who entered forbearance beginning of February and the beginning of March, but I'm not looking at people who entered once COVID happened and I'm comparing them to what I call our control borrowers who entered forbearance right before January 31st. And uh, I'll show you in the next slide, these borrowers on all observable characteristics are pretty much identical, but the people who are in my treatment section here were not reported late to credit bureaus. So in this figure here, just looking at the top left, on the horizontal axis, we have interest rate. On the vertical axis here, these are kernel density estimates simply for our treatment and control groups and all these different continuous borrower characteristics. If you look at the distribution of what their loan interest rates were, their loan amount at origination, they are identical. These borrowers look the same, and this figure is important to show that there is not a difference between our treatment and control borrowers, and they didn't have the power to manipulate whether they were on the other side of this line. So we can treat assignment here uh, as good as random. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this figure, but it's the, it's the same type of graph on the horizontal axis here. We have a borrower categorical trait, such as Lending Club's internal loan grade or their FICO at origination. And on the vertical axis, the percentage of the loans in the treatment or control group that fell into each one of these categories. Once again, if you break into these two groups, most of the borrowers had the same amounts of, of loans in whether they're in A, B, C, or D, or how long there was, how long their loan was in months. So these two groups of borrowers look pretty much the same. And now this is the most important graph of the paper. On the vertical axis here, this is the months since a borrower uh, entered hardship. On the vertical axis, this is their cumulative default rate broken out into treatment and control group. And if we look 10 months after these borrowers entered hardship, 
the treatment groups, both of these default rates are still high because that's not surprising. They were having trouble and entering hardship. But the treatment groups, cumulative default rates is about 35 to 37 percent versus the um, control groups, the uh, cumulative default rates about 60 percent. So this is a large gap in default for two groups of borrowers who look the same on the surface, but simply were a month apart and entering hardship. And we are going to try to trace this to their credit score. So once again, on the horizontal axis here, we have months since the borrower entered hardship. On the vertical axis here of our treatment and control group, we have their mean borrower FICO score. Now, if you look before either group entered hardship, their FICO scores are statistically not different. They are 10 months before about 680, and they are tracking down, which once again is, is not shocking because they entered hardship at this time. And then hardship happens, and they continue to fall, but we don't really see a separation for three or four months, which is not surprising because the law came a couple months later, and it takes a few months for a credit reporting change from a credit bureau to end up in your FICO score. But we, we do see seven or eight months later is there is a 15 point gap here. I'm not showing regression tables, but if I put this into a regression and added a bunch of borrower controls and time fixed effects and state fixed effects, there would still be this 15 point difference. And it's key for me to emphasize here, this is not mechanical. So for people who are defaulting, I am maintaining them in the sample at their last known FICO score. So these are non-defaulted borrowers, but simply by being in the treatment group here, you had a higher FICO by entering hardship at the right time after January 31st. So I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, I've tried to not show any regression tables, so I'm going to skip the regression table I have on the next slide. But uh, a problem, if you were just to regress defaults on FICO change, as I mentioned in the introduction, is that's incredibly, incredibly problematic. People who have higher FICO scores are more credit worthy. So what I do is I look at how much someone's FICO changed from right before they entered hardship to four months later, and I instrument that by whether they were a treated borrower. And you can just interpret the results here that for somebody who right before they entered hardship had a FICO score of about 650 and it dropped to about 635, they defaulted at about a 20 percentage point higher rate than people who didn't have this drop in FICO. And this can be attributed causally to this reporting change. I'll skip that. The, uh, another feature that I would like to point out is you now have seen a trend in figures that I have shown, once again on the horizontal axis, I have months since hardship start. We're looking on the vertical axis here, the mean uh, borrower outstanding balance of their loans. And you can see 10 months before, they both have outstanding balances of about 14,000. They're paying off their loans at the same rate. They enter hardship the payments slow down significantly, but then you see after three or four months, the treated group who got this artificial boost to their credit score start to pay down their loan again, and we have some pretty severe data limitations and access to the household's external uh, balance sheet, but we are interpreting this graph as the treatment group potentially had better access to external financing to continue to pay off their loan. I'm gonna skip this robustness test for time, um, and cross-sectionally, we do find that this default concentration among the people who took a negative hit to their credit score is concentrated in people who had higher FICO scores at the start, suggesting that this was more painful for them, and this could be coordination beliefs because they had coordination uh, benefits from others at the beginning. People thought they were good. Now people don't think they're of, of, of high credit worthiness. Um, these effects are not concentrated in, in renters, unemployed people. Um, and we have uh, data limitations to this because we can't see uh, these borrowers if uh, their access to other external financing. I can't see their balance sheet. Um, as a future part of this research that I would like to conduct, I would like to connect their uh, credit score shocks to spillovers and maybe their employment, housing, insurance. We know that credit score is often used in insurance pricing, but I think uh, importantly for this audience that I want to try to connect it to is an online lender. I think there's some alternative data implications here. There, there have been some research over the years that you know, online lenders are, are, are better at assessing credit risk. They have access to all these other sources of data. You know, they sometimes will predict your default whether you answer emails at 3 a.m. or 5 p.m. like a normal person, whether you have an iPhone 
or you have an Android. I have an Android, so I'd, I'd be determined more uh, credit risky. Um, <laughs> but despite, um, despite this, they have access to this alternative data, but there's clearly something going on here where these borrowers, nothing fundamental about them has changed, but their FICO scores has changed due to, due to a law, and their real outcomes are changing. So maybe uh, one way to interpret this paper is there's still a potential large need for soft sources of information evaluation for borrowers. And I think for this audience, that's something that um, you particularly excel at and uh, something to consider when evaluating people when we know sometimes credit bureaus make mistakes, people's credit scores are not always correct. Um, so with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs>